always kind of in my happy place, like most nature artists, we're just happy as we are out hiking or we're out exploring nature. And sometimes I don't even have to go very far to find that joy. Sometimes it's noticing a flower coming up through the sidewalk or something that's really minor. Um, one time I was in Rocky Mountain National Park, and of course that's a beautiful area in and of itself, but I came across this stream where aspen leaves had fallen into this stream and gotten trapped by a log that had fallen. And all the leaves were a different color. It was like looking at jewels. And I had these hikers that walked past me as I was clamoring around in this shallow stream trying to get photographs of it as reference material. And just because it was so beautiful, and they were like, What are you taking pictures of? And I was like, How can you look at this and not see this natural beauty? Because to me, it was just it took my breath away the more time I spent in it. And in kind of a roundabout fashion, my college degree was actually animal sciences with a minor in genetics. So I came from a science background and ended up in the arts kind of serendipitously. I always enjoyed drawing and did a lot of pet portraits for people from college for a little bit of side income and continued to do that um, for quite a while. Slowly my prices increased and increased and eventually I came to a point in my profession where there was a bridge and I didn't feel like the job was working out. And I said, well, let's see if I can make this art thing happen. And uh, that was about 13 years ago. And it's been a wild and crazy ride, but I'm having a lot of fun. And I still love the sciences, but I still also love the arts. And I try to bring, not that I bridge them together, but probably most of you have seen my work. It does have probably a, um, a very meticulous feel to it that comes that science side comes from a very particular about anatomy and getting that type of thing right and uh try to bridge my love of animals and nature and bring them into my artwork and bring you into that environment that i experienced thank you that's great and i've learned a lot about nature and animals through art is probably more than i have in you know science classes at least of recent years but um if I ever need to know what kind of bird I'm looking at, I've got a whole bunch of people I can call up and say, what, what is this? So it's super great, uh, that one of the benefits. So, um, and each of you have a very distinctive style and uh, similar mediums, oil painting for the two of you and scratchboard, which Kathy will share a little bit more about how she gets her amazing work if you haven't um, experienced that before. But um, your style, and I love how you, know, you branch out like, um, You've got some pieces on copper, Trevor, that are new and exciting. But um, just really tell us a little bit about how what the animal means to you and, and why it's so important to you to capture it and convey that with us, the viewers of your work. So I spoke a little bit about that, that moment when you see something and the world just kind of falls away and then you forget about everything else. You forget you have a mortgage. You forget about you know, all these things, that all your due dates or whatever it is. For me, it's those moments, whether it be a squirrel or an elk or an elephant, it's those moments when everything just kind of falls and you're here, you're in this kind of, you're in the zone that it's just like, you know, this is the moment that you want to remember. And there's a lot of times that it may be just like a little piece of something that is all you're seeing, or sometimes it's the entire scene. So what I, you know, then kind of, re, you know, try and capture that, remember what that was. I, I walk around with it, with, you know, when we're on the hikes, with a camera, with a sketchbook, trying to take notes and remember, okay, what was it about this moment? Was it the sky? Was it the color? Was it the stance of the animal? And then really kind of look back and say, here's this moment that you know, I saw this great elk and I want to share it with you. The only way I can do, I can use words, but I stumble over words. I could write it down, but that doesn't fully totally translate. The best thing I can do in order to share this moment with you or whoever wants to see it is to use those colors, use this paint, recreate that moment, and say, hey, look, wasn't this cool? Here's this moment of whatever it was. And that's really what it comes down to. It's just wanting to share. I don't like to share my food. I don't like to share a lot of other things. But I don't touch his this. paintbrushes. Oh, yeah, gosh. do not touch my paintbrushes. But it's, I, I, this is just something in here, like, hey, here's this really cool moment. Let, let me share this with you the only way that I know how, the best way I know how. And here's this, and here's the story that comes with it. And one of the things about your paintings is that how important all the surroundings are to the animals. You do some with just the animal, but so much of your work, we, we pick up the whole story around it. Well, that's it. I equate it to when you, when you write a, it's like I'm kind of writing a book or I'm writing a story. So each, each piece has a little bit of a story to it. You can't have a good story without back characters. If all you're listening to is somebody talk about a main character. There's no interaction. There's no nothing, nothing that that doesn't make it interesting. 
So I do end up spending a lot of time on the background, as much time on the background as I do on the subject, because that's what gives it character. That's what gives it a story. That's what gives it that place. Even if it's just kind of the vignette color or with the, the metal or some of the patina colors, that what is what sets the stage. If it's something that's vibrant, it can be you know, exciting and dramatic. That's going to be, give you a whole different character than something that's subtle or soft or more atmospheric. That really sets the whole tone of where you're going to go, and then your subject carries the weight of the rest of the story. Like any good book, like you know, without a Harry Potter, all the rest of the interesting wizarding world is not that much. But it's that that really kind of digs you in, brings you in through that subject. But the rest of the stuff was, brings it all to life and gives you the ability to say. I feel like I've been there. And that's one of the greatest compliments that I get from people when they look at my work, whether they're hikers. I've had people look at it and think, I feel like I've been here. I have no idea what an this animal is, but I feel like I've been in this this space right here looking at this and sharing that with you. That's the best thing that I that I can do. I've been able to fully impart that vision. Absolutely. Thank you. And uh, your detail is so so amazing too. It looks like you could pet pet the animals, but the one, don't pet the one that's back there. It says wet. That's oh, okay. the brushes you can pet. They are dry. Don't touch the brushes. Don't touch the wet paint. Okay. Okay. So I want to uh, jump over to, to Jan, who uh, is our first time having Jan in the show. Obviously, you've been an amazing painter and collected all over the world. So we're excited to have her. And, and you do a wide range of subject as far as de destination or location. Um, but you do, uh, most of your work starts as a plein air piece. You want to yes. share about that? Yes. 90% uh, of it starts as a plein air piece. So that's the joy, is going on location, finding a great spot, getting the quality of light that just, it might just occur for a minute. And I have to capture that moment in time and not chase that light and be able to translate that into a painting in a, in a very short period of time. So I'm painting very small. And I'll take those pieces, bring them into the studio. The best ones get turned into large studio paintings. And if they still convey that feeling, that moment, exactly what you were talking about. So I'm trying to create something that you could step right into, that you could walk into this window and have that in your living room. I want to be able to share what I experienced in that moment in time, be it in the high Rockies or on the beaches of Hawaii or here in Arizona and be able to take it and, and uh, let you experience the same thing. And I love this brochure. Are these on the tables or? Uh, or we have some, I'm running low. Okay, <laughs> so you can come up here and look, but so she says she paints small on location, but not always because on this brochure, you can see she's got a like a full size what twenty four by thirty five four by four by five yeah. So imagine this darling blonde girl standing on the beach with a big bigger than you uh, canvas. What do people say when you're out painting? Well, first of all, I have to weight everything down because usually where I'm painting it's a little bit windy. So I've got a giant sail, and uh, my husband Danny helps a lot. He runs and gets stakes and ties things off the mango trees and holds things down sometimes when I'm painting them. Um, people, the larger the canvas is, the more attention you attract, um, but it also can be really, really difficult. Like that painting, I painted in a cow pasture and they let in the calves by mistake uh, with the mama cows and uh, female cows are really protective of their young. And I was actually in danger at that point. And fortunately my car was really close and Danny helped me put the canvas in the car. And um, another time we were hiking up there to start the studies for this. And uh, they had let the cows in again. And uh, it's a very, very steep spot, very steep hill. And my girlfriend was walking down the hill and she stepped in a big pile and went sliding down the hill. And the word she said was really appropriate. <laughs> so, she, she stepped in it and she yeah. said it. Oh, yeah, she sat there and said it. Yeah. Well, that's why I said plain air painting is not for the faint of heart. And you might it's not. want to explain a little bit what plain air means in case people are plain familiar. Plein air is a French term that means outdoors. But yeah, the French invented everything. 
<laughs> the, the French and the Italians really started plein air painting and with the advent of tube colors, uh, artists could go out and paint on location. They weren't stuck in their studios binding rocks down to create paint. And so that really changed painting completely when, when um, tube colors were invented and plein air painting started. And also before that, it was primarily the church that supported painting. And so the subjects were limited to that. And so uh, plein air painters paint everyday life. We paint from nature, we paint landscapes, we paint people that you know are just ordinary people. And it's, uh, it's a great way to convey a moment in time and our history that we're experiencing right now. So color and light are obviously two critical things that you're capturing. Yes. I mean, every artist does, but certainly in that plain air, you've got just moments, really. Well, and the light is more important than the color, even though, what is it? Um, value is most important, important, but color gets all the credit. And that's true. You're really attracted to the color in the painting, but if that value is not right in there, you're not going to like it. You're not going to like the painting. It's just going to be, there's something wrong with this, but I'm not quite sure what it is. So it's very important to get your values right, and that's all about light. Absolutely. Do you carry uh, many colors with you when you are out on location or do you love blending? Sometimes I carry only three colors plus white. And I try to keep my kit really small. And I can actually paint on paper in a sketchbook and, the, and with my three colors, I can carry very, very little. So, it, and that's when I'm painting really small. When I'm painting large like that, that's a whole big setup. <laughs> I can I can just feel that wind as you get picked up. Yeah, <laughs> the Hawaii afternoon wind. Um, I don't think we brought it up here, but maybe Danny will bring it up in a little bit. The, oh, yeah. the other, we have a sample of an actual on location painting that that we want to pass around. But um, so Kathy, let's let's move on down here. And Kathy's work, it looks again. We don't touch it, but it looks like you can pet it when you when you own it. Then you can pet it. Is that the real? Um, but. It's so her your subject matters are spectacular and your medium are, are so inviting. So I'm gonna just let you go for it. You get to go for it? Yeah. They usually don't let me do that. <laughs> so most of you or many of you have heard me describe scratchboard if you've come through my booth, but in case there's anybody that hasn't, it's a subtractive art form which makes it really unique because most art forms are primarily additive. We're adding paint on the canvas. But in Scratchboard, I'm actually taking away from the surface. So it's a dark ink over the top of a light layer, and I use sharp tools like X-Acto, tattoo needles, and sandpaper to remove that surface and expose the white that's underneath. And then the works that are colored, the color part is additive, but it's done back over the top of the black and white layer of scratching. So anything that has color had to have the white clay exposed first. And so many people that do Scratchboard just do black and white, but I do both black and white and color, depending on the subject matter. And, uh, I do more color nowadays than I used to, and I used to do a lot of black and white, and I love them both. So um, for me, one of the things that I love about this technique is that amount of detail that I can put into the work and that nothing against the detailed painting because I love paintings as well, but when you get close to a detailed painting, you look at it and you go, there's brush strokes. When you get close to a detailed scratch board, even under a magnifying glass, which pre-COVID I used to have in my booth, it looks like animal hair. It looks like it, you can sink your fingers into there and that there would be another layer of fur underneath there. I'm sorry to tell you, they're not as soft as they look. <laughs> but for example, um, this beautiful goat in a coat. Can I tell you a coat story? Okay. okay, so some of you may be familiar that uh, over the last few years, Judith Dickerson has chosen one artist that is represented here in the show, the other artists paint or draw in their particular style or technique. So starting last year with Anthony Barbona, who's a beautiful glass blower, I drew him as a chimpanzee. So this year's artist is my good pal and neighbor, John Linton, black and white photographer. So John knew that he was going to be depicted as some type of animal because I don't know humans. So I told John when we were getting ready to do this photo shoot, I said, John, you got to bring in your fur coat because he sometimes wears these fur coats. And I said, I want to photograph you in the fur coat. And, and so he brought in his fur coat and we took these photos just outside the tents here. And uh, he was trying to guess for days what type of animal I was going to draw him as. He did not guess a goat. 
Well, the funny part was after I show it to him and he loved it and everybody thought it was hilarious, it turns out his daughter's very favorite animal is a goat. <laughs> a bit more perfect. And he is the goat. And he is the goat. That is the title, greatest of all times. So I love whimsy. I do, I do a lot of serious pieces, but I also do a lot of pieces that make me smile and I hope they make the viewers smile as well. Um, some of you have probably seen my jackalope uh, shadow piece that's on the front of my booth this year, um, which I totally have diverged from what the initial question was about textures. And I tend to do that, get off a little tangent. <laughs> so textures, uh, that's right. Yeah, so he was wearing his fur coat. I had to show the reference photo because not all of you have seen him wear his fur coat, but. <laughs> One of the challenges in Scratchboard is creating different textures because I'm working with a very limited number of tools and most of those tools are very sharp and rigid and yet I'm trying to create something that looks soft and fluffy. And so that's where it comes in using these different tools like sandpaper and tattoo needles that we don't use in other art forms very often. And uh, it just makes for all, all different types of textures and creating everything from water to fur to trees and, and uh, choida and cactuses. Do you have a favorite animal? I love the entire animal kingdom with the exception of ticks and mosquitoes. <laughs> yes, and you can make anything look, look awesome and amazing. And by the way, those are great tail grackles that were probably calling outside a couple yeah. minutes ago. I was like, they came in just, just in time for the nature works. Yeah. Instead of the jets, we have the birds today. So um, very good. And like I said, if you're ever out hiking or, or wandering and you see a bird that you don't know, check with your artist friends if they're nature um, I've done that more than a few times. Like, what is this? Um, so, I was going to ask you something else. Oh, did you show your inks? I did not. So these are. This is my entire color palette, right here. Unlike a lot of uh, painters, where they can go by, you know, seven different shades of red. I have one red. So if I need a more yellow red, I mix some yellow in with the. Or if I need more orangey red, I mix some yellow in. If I need more of a bluer red, I mix some some blue into it. Purpley red. Um, so a lot of my work, actually, I, I teach Scratchboard at various times, and I was working on a presentation for uh, color in a class I was going to do, and I realized that I combine sepia, which is one of the colors I have here, which is the brown, red and yellow for like 70% of my colors. Like almost all animals have some shade of brown on them, whether it's reddish brown like a fox or whether it was uh, cool or whether it was a tiger's color. I was like, wow, I use those three colors a lot. So it is interesting how even within this kind of interesting color spectrum. I had a color palette, essentially. Fascinating. Thank you very much. And uh, yes, don't pet unless you own. We have that, you know, some places, some artists are invite you to touch, but um, I think, was it Sunday and Brad the other day that said the same thing? Because um, they would use, they used to do a lot of like state fairs and things and you know, people will be walking around with a turkey leg and then touching the belt. So, so it was like, no, no. So uh, you wouldn't do that. No touching. So, okay. So Jan, Danny brought this over and I'm going to do the same thing with this. I'll try to just pass it around or, okay. So you can tell them a little bit of the story. I, I think it's not available because Danny won't let you sell it. But. Well, I, Danny and I got to do a wonderful trip two years ago that was a backpacking llama trip. So all of our, I went with a whole bunch of artists and two fishermen, he, him being one of the fishermen. And the llamas carried all of our art supplies. I want my own llama, llama now, they are awesome. And we have brought 12 llamas, six artists, two fishermen and two guides. The guides cooked all of our food and all we had to do for uh, six days was paint. Oh my God. It was wonderful. We went way up into, uh, out of Landers, Wyoming, into this area full of glacial cirques. And so I did this little study. This is just to show you what I can do in a short period of time that I'm going to take into the studio and do a large piece from. So uh, that one is uh, willows and uh, a little waterfall, and it's not, a, to you, it's probably not enough information to uh, utilize for a large painting, but for me, because that's my memory, you know, that I can take that and remember everything that was out there, and it, it's like taking shorthand notes, and so I can take that and uh, grid it out, 
and incorporate it into a three by four foot painting, which is my plan. And it was a, and it, uh, the other thing about that trip is we went up to about 11,000 feet and we, and the guys went fishing and we ended up with so many trout. We, they threw most of them back. We ended up with a huge trout dinner for everybody. So um, it was delicious. Yeah. They fed us well, we all gained weight. <laughs> I would like to go on that trip. You would love it. It's, it's luxury, it's glamping. I can hook you up. My mom runs Pequamas. Oh, oh yeah? yeah. Okay, out of where? Uh, they're in Oregon. Oh wow, that's incredible. Yeah, this is this is Landers, and they have a hundred llamas that they breed and raise and sell to other places. Yeah, you probably know. Shelby Keith is the sister. She's a very famous painter, and she's the sister of the uh, woman that owns the, the couple that owns the ranch. Small world, I know, love it, especially in the art world. Um, well, thank you for sharing that. And and the backstory, the reason I know that's the only thing you left is you sold every one of the the, the yes. studies that you did, and then Danny said you can't sell that one, or he bought it. So yeah, he, he bought it. I never saw the money, but he bought it. <laughs> <laughs> Because I, I think we all cherish those memories. And one thing I, I always like to mention too, um, each of these artists here also do commission work. And like we were recently in Hawaii and I have some beautiful photograph. Well, I think they're beautiful. Um, they're beautiful. And I was like, um, I could just get that or I could commission. So if you have like a favorite memory that you want to have captured in art, um, we can do animal portraits. We can do anywhere in the world destination All landscapes. Yeah, seasons. and and if and like I thought I have this picture, but I'd like the sky to be a little bit more colorful. I think she could make that happen. We could work it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So combine a couple of photographs or whatever. Um, but I think I just think it's so exciting because we talked last week about building a collection, and many many of us tend to buy art when we're on vacation, because we want to capture not just the artwork, but the moment in time. And you can do that even after the fact, if, if you have a, an artist friend that can hook you up. So um, Trevor, you are just amazing in the range of what you can do. Um, you're, you're just amazing. You're a magnificent human being. Am I right, Jen? He's, yeah. Um, we always have to get validation from the spouse to make sure we're on the right track. But um, your your work, I mean, literally, you could walk right into your, your pieces. Um, you take us to Africa. You take us to the Rocky Mountains. Um, you've been to these places, and you do have some stories. Yeah. Unfortunately, as you can also attest to, I find myself in stupid situations every once in a while. Uh, when we were talking about llamas, for a little while there, I was definitely on a kick of like old equipment, old, you know, interesting barns, interesting stuff. I'm deep in the heart of Montana, and these the scraggly old little junkyard that I came across. So I had stopped to take pictures, and immediately, as soon as I had stopped, got out of my truck, this like 200-year-old Ford F-150 comes racing up, and this old guy jumps out. He's like, what are you, you know, what are you doing in my land? And all these things like this is right out of like one of those weird stories. Great, I think I'm, I'm gonna die here. And I said, well, you know, first of all, you know, artists, I, I'd seen these old tractors over here. I was just trying to get some photos and take a picture. And he well, if that's what you want to do, then hop in, we'll do a little tour. I'm, I'm getting his accent all terrible, but it was just one of those days like, oh, either I'm gonna die here or this is gonna be an incredible experience. So jumped in his truck. There is no such thing as suspension or comfort in this truck whatsoever. So I have my, my camera, my sketch bag, and we're just doing a tour while we had to go pick up his nephew and his girlfriend that were up fishing up in the lake somewhere. We got to see his old drying rack. And then on the way back, he's like, I'm just going to drop you off here. Your truck's over that hill. I'm sure you, you, know, you can probably find your way back. He's like, I've got to go do something over here. This, But in the midst of all this, he, he leaves. And I swear, I wish this was on video, but he said, oh, don't mind those guard llamas. Look at that. What did he say? And they're off. You know, they're off to go do their thing. 
come around, there's a big pin of kind of where these this old equipment is because one of these days he's going to get out there and get them tracked to work again. He just hasn't had the time to get to it. They're old rust buckets, but they're beautiful. So I come around the corner and there are these two mangiest, biggest, scariest llamas I have ever seen in my entire life. And this gigantic fat cat that just all of them are glaring at me. Shoot. You know, it's like I really want to get in there and take some pictures. And all of a sudden they start their kissing, their ears are coming up, they're stomping the ground. Like they're llamas, what could they do to me? <laughs> but thank God I've got a telephoto because there's no way I'm going in that yard. It's like that cat was just sitting there hissing, the llamas were spitting. It's like this is too, this is too much. And of course, I'm by myself, there's no one to share this with. So I just went around and got some different pictures here. I did not brave the llamas. They don't have any top teeth. <laughs> they didn't look like they were fierce. These were they, they were dire llamas. Or something. I read way too many horror stories. It's like these things are going to turn into something else. But they have those horns that kind of look like demon ears. Those, those are ears. I've right, got a really good imagination. <laughs> This is, proof, there. this is proof of a nature lover. The llamas have horns. Well, they look like horns. They didn't look super. I have and scarier, red eyes. I, have I think they had red story. eyes. I have a scarier story. I'm ready. I was hiking with Danny around this tiny lake. Yeah, it's called Piney Lake in Colorado. And we ended up stopping. I set up and I painted these beautiful flowers. They were about this big and they're bright red and they had lots of hummingbirds flying around them and I set up in the hummingbird field apparently and they started dying bombing. I mean they were totally after me so you think llamas are scary try hummingbirds yeah. <laughs> it was deadly they look cute but they're fierce and small but mighty yes I mean if we're telling our life and death stories of animals <laughs> so just this, just this last summer, I was uh, up near Rocky Mountain National Park right after the elk had calved. And I came across this group of uh, about six cows with very young calves, like little tiny, born in the last week calves. And they took them out in this, they were absolutely adorable. They were all just laying there. And I'm a, I have a very large telephoto lens. I'm always very respectful to wildlife, but I work mostly from pho photography. So I spend a lot of time out taking photos and Many of my works are composites and numerous photos put together to come up with a story or a composition. But these elk cows get up and they go out into this little shallow pond and they take their calves for what had to have been their first swimming lesson. And it was absolutely the cutest thing. And they walked out, they called to the calves, the calves very nervously came out in the water. And one of the calves swims back to the shore. And I was still a long ways away. But the other cows decide they're going to go across the pond to the other side. And so this one cow whose calf had come back kind of towards the same shore I was on, but not close to me, she realizes she cannot see her calf because it has gone up into the tree line. And she sees me way out on this point, a quarter mile away with my big telephoto lens, and has, decides that I have stolen her calf. And she is calling to it and calling to it and calling to it. And and she starts trotting towards me through the pond. And I was like, oh, I got to get out of here. And <laughs> fortunately, I had planned out my escape route because I have had other animals come after me in the past. Um, we won't go into those stories. So I've learned over exper through it experience when you're photographing, especially females with babies, you always need to have a, a way to get away, get out of there quickly and don't wait until they're close to you to make, to make that decision. So I ended up cutting across this swamp and uh, climbing up a hillside and uh, the, the calf finally reappeared and mom settled down, but it definitely got the heart beating pretty well for a little while. But I did get some fantastic photos of, of them out with their first swimming lesson. So sweet. And you are a world-class photographer as well, but we kind of keep you focused on scratch board here, but um, definitely it's your resource. So yep. yeah, I've won some national awards with photography, but it, there's so photography is such a competitive world because of digital photography and there are of course tons of amazing wildlife and nature photographers out there as well and of course john linton who does the beautiful landscapes that's here in this show but um 
scratch board is a little more unique and um, it's something that I'm passionate about both of them, but I love photography almost as much as I love doing my scratch board. And often, even before I come into the show, like yesterday morning, I was at the Gilbert Riparian Preserve for three hours before the show, uh, taking photos of the birds and, and was hoping that there would be fog coming off of the ponds because of the cold weather, but there was not. But still beautiful morning, uh, watching the egrets and the shorebirds and whatnot. So that you, you're kind of keying in on something that I really appreciate and, and hope that, that you all do too, is that I do believe that artists make us sometimes stop and slow down and notice things that we may not notice. And if, even if even if it's just in the, the work that we're looking at on the wall or the sculpture, or if it invites us to slow down in our everyday life. And truly, I, I kind of joked about if I need to know what kind of bird I call an artist, but it has taught me how to appreciate and see the, the beauty that we live in. And um, I think sometimes that's missing in this world where we're so connected to you know screens and disconnected with people to allow us to slow down enough to reconnect to the natural beauty, I think is a gift. And we thank you for that, each of you. But those stories, I remember a couple of years ago, David Jackson and Kirk Randall sharing a story and it just kind of came up again today. They were at a home of a collector back in Minnesota and farmland and they had found a place they wanted to, to paint and they set up and kind of like your story, the owner came over and he's like, I'm not asking you to stay. And like, get off my property. So it does, you know, you do sometimes put yourself in precarious positions, but um, I think you had a, a wild boar or something. Yeah. You don't have to relive it if, if it hurts. No, it's our, I've recovered by now. Yeah, we were in Africa where everything wants to kill you. Every critter that's out there. We were actually, it was one of those, uh, it was our, a safari trip that we were actually, we were helping collect a lot of the meat for a lot of the tribes that the, the people were working with. We got to see some incredible, incredible things. One of the, the ones that might near-death experience and maybe want to come home and just be an artist and not do that for a living. Thank you very much. Is uh, we were hunting these Cape Buffalo. And we were kind of in this swampy place in the in the Okavango Delta, just above in Botswana. And they we had taken the meat and carved it all up, put it back in the boats to go back to the people. And there was just not enough room for us in the boat. So we just were hiking back to the, the camp and one came out of the jungle. All we had time to do was kind of crunch up and say, oh shoot. Kind of hit me in the back, knocked me over. It was like all I remember doing was, you know, I came to the ground just seeing this big hairy butt in my vision going going through the rest of the swamp. It was just one of those days that what just happened? And we were, I think we were very fortunate that it was a female just trying to get back to the herd because they're really aggressive animals. And it's like they if it was a male, he would have turned around and tried to just try and listen to kill us. Went through us like bowling balls. There was like six guys in this whole group and just whoosh, knocked everybody for a loop. And that same trip home, we were stuck in a river with crocodiles because we had no boat to get back. And that was that time where I was, I was the shortest guy on the on the trip. We're going, you know, across the water, holding all your gear above your head. And I just kept sliding down the way, sliding down the way. And he was like, come on, man, there's crocs in the water. Let's move. I can't touch. I'm slipping, going down the river. What? Where, where are you going? It was just like, I gotta go home. I, I won't go home. I don't wanna do this anymore. But it was, I mean, I still paint from that trip. There was just incredible, incredible stuff. And then there was the time that. And I bet, I, Jennifer, do you want him not to ever leave again when he comes back after that? <laughs> Funny, I got a broken jaw. Oh, no, there was that. That's a uh, whole different story, though. Yeah road trips but um again you take us to those places and hearing those stories makes me laugh but it's still it's about appreciating the animal and um what has it meant to you to be from a family of, of artists and how do you feel about carrying on that legacy you know it's, it's interesting because it's i think getting into art it's always been an example of, with me that i i've seen people make a living do this i see what kind of life that they were able to build and as much as I would miss sometimes, you know, state of the tech and having, you know, not having to worry about paying bills, this, 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 
there's something that's really rewarding with the freedom that comes comes to this and at the end of the day and to be able to create something make a difference in someone's life or create something special you know the get paid things happen everything that works out but it just to have that little bit of what is, is this quote close to reality of magic that we get that we get close to as as humans i think we, you know when you you touch creativity it, it's as, as little as close as we can to that other thing that's that's intangible and to be able to do that and then make a living doing that support our family i'm very it, it's a blessing oh, yeah. is really what it comes down to so true and for us as well really and uh i i always like to ask it is there ever has there ever been a work of art that you wish you had kept that somebody has or do you know i can paint another one yes there are many works of art that i wish i still had um that's what the jacquet process is for <laughs> because <laughs> If you have something you really love, you really don't want to sell it, and you really need to because somebody else wants to buy it and they're waving the money in your face, then um, you tell them, well, how would you feel about me making a jacle print of it for myself or for future uh, customers? And I've done that many times because I want to keep that image. I want to keep that memory. And really, also, what I love to keep is the studies that I do, um, the plein air studies, those like that one. Um, I, I think it's, they have the energy of the original feeling of being there. And that's, that's what I really value. It, it may, the painting may mean a lot to somebody else, but the story is going to mean even more to me. Do people ever buy the study and the, yes, the studio piece? Yes, many times. Um, I'll sell the study with the studio piece. And, and that's, People that understand art will, will do that because they they understand the translation and how it is so important to have to be able to convey that energy into the studio painting, which is actually really hard to do. Um, it's it's much easier to you to feel the light and the situation when you're there, and to try to convey that in the studio. It can get stale, so I have to constantly remind myself of what that situation felt like and you know how the wind felt and um there you know the moose that was standing behind me watching me paint the whole time that I didn't know about you know how that felt when I discovered there was a moose there you know all, all these uh situations in nature there's always some surprise there's always a story in fact when you go talk to these painters ask them the story behind the painting and they'll go on <laughs> right you might wish you didn't ask. <laughs> there you go. Careful what you ask for. Yeah. Well, that was the day that. <laughs> yeah. All right, buddy. Enough. I guess for me, I'm not sure that uh, for me, the experience of creating the artwork is part of that memory that I create with the experience of that piece. That, of me being out in nature, having that experience, taking those photos, watching nature. I spend a lot of time, I do a lot of photography, but I also do a lot of looking through binoculars watching, just watching, just sitting quietly in nature, absorbing the environment, feeling the energy around me, and just watching the animals. And seeing how the musculature and the tendons and that kind of thing move and how the bull elk puffs up when he's challenging another male and the body posture. And in some ways, photos doesn't, don't capture that whole environment. So sometimes you can get so fixated on taking pictures that you lose the feeling of the world around you. And so I try to really be cognizant that I also take time to just enjoy being in nature. So for me, the artwork is just an extension of that feeling of those stories that we've talked about. Um, my work doesn't always include some, this piece has a lot of background elements and, and um, environment, but many of my pieces are more fixated on just close-ups of the animals because I love the texture of scratch board so much and bring those textures into the piece. But nevertheless, I can tell you the stories about the horses or the animals that, and, that were tied in with gathering my reference material and the experience that I have with those animals and trying to bring all of that together. So I'm, I would rather have um, my art in a collector's home truly being enjoyed than me moving it from show to show and having it in a cardboard box. But there are pieces that I'm more attached to than others. And I've done portraits of my own personal pets that I don't sell. Yes. yes. And last year, uh, 
There's so many great things. I want to have you talk about this, but last year you did, she did this amazing piece called A Hair to the Left. And I don't even think you had it done and it was like gone. So she did make reproductions of that on aluminum or, uh, or can uh, I have some on aluminum and some on a fine art paper. But so not only is she extremely talented, there's the humor because it's a it's it's a hair who's on the left side looking at a shadow. So it's a hair to the left. Well, I, uh, many of you have seen it on the front of my booth this year, and it's a rabbit, and it's next to a choya that kind of is coming up next to it. And the shadow is, is the fun part of the storyline with this piece. And I just actually sold the print of it, so it's not, if you come back to my booth, you're not going to see it, but I can show you a paper print of it because I just sold the one that was hanging on the front. But um, the shadow looks like a jackal. And so I asked several artists what I should title this piece, and some of them said title it Jackalope. And I said, no, no, no. I want it, I want them to just I want you to discover that little nugget of the shadow telling the story of the jackalope, uh, not the title to tell you that. And so I I had a couple of fun fun titles and but it ended up being just the hair to the left. And I love doing titles, I love wordplay and puns and that kind of thing. So many of my titles are a little bit funny. So, and that that one is on a white board, which is, I don't even know how to describe it. It's not a black scratch board, it's a white scratch board. So it's not a white scratch board. It's oh. white. It's white. <laughs> so this is, a, this is clay. This is the layer that is underneath a typical black scratch board, the layer that I'm scratching down to. But if I scratch on this white layer, there's nothing underneath. It's not like oh, some people think it's white on top and black underneath, but it's not. So if I want to do a scratch board on a piece like this, I uh, use a paintbrush to put my ink where I want to do my scratching. So in the case of the jackrabbit, the pieces like this, I put a dark silhouette where the rabbit was going to be at and where the cactus was going to be at and then more diluted inks on the ground. And the shadow was put in with also diluted inks. But in order to scratch through, I have to apply something on top of the surface. But it starts with just a black silhouette of the animal and the vegetation. It's, it's amazing. I remember in way back grade school we had some scratch board project where we put we could yeah we colored the background and yeah it obviously didn't stick with me because i'm just but, a collector but i think it's actually as a scratch board artist that's often how many people their first experience was doing crayons and wax paper and you melted it and then it was black timber paint or something on top but how many of you remember doing that in school yeah i think honestly how many of our like um first grade school projects do we remember like not very many art projects that we remember, but many, many, many people remember doing that. There's something so intrinsically rewarding about creating a mark and seeing something vibrantly pop up from underneath that I get to enjoy that experience every single time I create a firework. So this piece here, um, it looks like it's back. I mean, you, you captured the light perfectly, and I don't, I don't always think about light being used in scratch board. I think of it, you know, light being so important in uh, plain air painting, but Tell us about that. I think light is incredibly important in scratch board because you're working with something that has such darks and such lights as, as even as I'm working in the black and white layer. And backlighting is my favorite, both in photography and in my own work because it's so dramatic with those dark backgrounds. And this piece actually started out on an all black, on an all black scratch board. And kind of towards the end, I decided that I didn't, wasn't in love with the composition of having the black extend all the way up to the top of that piece. And so I use, um, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, how many of you are familiar with that product? <laughs> so that is actually one of the products I use for removing large areas of black off of a board. So I took the whole skyline down to pure white, and then I use an uh, airbrush to put the, the blues and oranges and that real subtle twilight feel into the piece. And then I came back and added the um, receding saguaros along the skyline kind of as my very final stage on that piece. But I. There's a, I teach in Tucson at the Sonora Desert Museum pretty often, and sometimes I stay in town and I go over Gates Pass, which is a big throughway to get from one side of Tucson to the other. And I'm usually coming over it kind of early in the morning as I'm getting ready to teach. And there is just a spot on that pass where every saguaro, every choya is just lit up and glows like this scene. And there's no shoulder for me to pull out in that spot and make photos. But every day that I do that drive, it just takes my, I don't, I've seen it probably 75 times and every day still, I'm like, holy cow, that's just gorgeous. 
And there's just something about that. We don't love Troya when you're walking through them, but they are really beautiful when they're backlit. And the saguaros and owls do nest in saguaro cactus. And so this is a great horned owl that's flying through the desert as the sun is either rising or setting. I picture it being the setting sun, but it could be sunrise as well. So great, thank you. Again, it allows us to take a moment and slow down and, and appreciate. And we are surrounded by amazing beauty here. Um, a lot of times we're out there looking at the sunset and I'll go, wait, but look over there and you see it on the mountain and the colors, the purples and the oranges. It's just truly amazing. Um, so thank you guys for capturing that for us when we can't always see that. Um, I was I had a question for Jan, but I can't think of it at the moment. But um, do any questions from our wonderful group here? Okay. I just really had a comment. It looks like all of these pieces up here are backlit. I mean, look at the, the light from every single one of these pieces. Look like they have light coming from within. I mean, even the one of John Lennon right there, or <laughs> they all look like they're back. I mean, Trevor, they, they all do. They're just amazing pieces, really. It's the luminosity of the paint and utilizing warm and cool colors against each other. So you're going to have that glow, whether or not it's back with and I noticed yours is side lit, and it it has uh, an incredible glow to it. And yeah, yeah, you built the contrast. Beautiful. You underpaint? Yeah, I I underpaint um, to get rid of the white canvas because the white canvas is glaring at me and saying I'm not painting it yet. So I I cover the whole painting with usually sepia or. Um, uh, raw sienna and viridian, which is neutral. It's a kind of a neutral glow. And then, uh, and then I work on top of that. So if there is anything showing after that, it's still neutral. So you don't see the, the white coming through. Yeah, exactly. And that's the color of sunlight. I under scratch. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Trevor, what about you? Do you I've got no fear of a, a white can canvas. I think growing up with it, it's uh, just it's there. It's just waiting for something to happen. So it just like I start in the left hand corner and work my way down. I'm right handed and trying not to. All my goal is every day not to stick my finger in it. Don't drag your paint. Don't drag your finger through the paint. I'm always working up here, work my way down. Very systematic. Not very clean still, but sometimes it doesn't always happen. Speaking of white canvases. Um, Canvas John comes every Thursday and delivers <laughs> canvases, uh, custom stretch canvas. There's an eight foot tall, yeah, he's not here either. Aiden Kringen ordered this. Oh. It's eight feet tall by about five feet. I think it's a five by eight. I can't wait to see what that turns into, but yeah. he's not been here since it was delivered yesterday morning because he's home doing something. And several of the artists have really been eyeing this canvas. Um, <laughs> So it'll be fun to see what that turns into. Um, but yeah, and that's just again to show you how fresh the show is. Like artists are constantly making new work here and constantly having art work go out the door. And um, you know, this great guy from Palm Springs, John brings canvases, delivers them to the artists every, every Thursday. And he also does framing. And so there's a great little network here, for sure. But um, I think like, I love Jan's work too because from from a distance it looks like you're looking out the window at at you know the view from your house. You get a little closer and you see more of the uh, the impressionistic style to it, where Trevor's really tight. And my work is becoming more and more impressionistic. I when when I had a year off and I'm stuck in Hawaii, which is <laughs> not bad. Um, I really got to explore some. Uh, I got to explore some things that I've been wanting to do for years. And I really got into color theory and interaction of interaction of color and thicker brush strokes and directional brush strokes. So this one is really about the directional brush strokes and also the full spectrum of color. And that uh, I really utilized those techniques in that and had a really good time with it. 
It's it's a magnificent painting. Thank you. It is. So, um, do you want to tell them how you travel back and forth from Hawaii with your paintings? This is, I mean, it, it, it harkens back to the French, and they go out on location and they right. didn't take you know stretch canvas. Well, uh, so I take. Uh, I usually work on a canvas panel, and those are those are pretty thin, and so those can go in a suitcase, and they're because they're smaller. But what I also bring back is all my large pieces. I work up to three by four feet, and I um, the TSA knows me now. They, they just they, they see us coming, Danny with his jewelry, and me with my big paintings and these big giant bike boxes. I can I can fit five paintings stretched gallery rock canvases into bike boxes that I telescope together and take back up and uh, and they put them on the plane and I utilize only Alaska Airlines because they only charge me $35. Wow. Yeah, so Alaska Airlines I've got big stuff from, to and from Hawaii yeah. or, so. or from the show. You know, if you're flying back to Wisconsin and you want to actually bring the painting with you, I found it to be a really safe way to transport paintings, way safer than the mail services because they're not going to get kicked around. They're only going to go from one place to the next. So, and, and I'm, I'm always asking logistics questions. I'm like, yes. so how do you get that from A to B? Because that's what I do. But um, again, uh, it's always fascinating hearing the behind the scenes of what goes into all this. But do we have any other questions? Anyone? Wendy? I just want to say you guys give us a painting. Because after you were talking, I said to myself, sorry, I just wanted to make a comment. And, and, and after all of you have talked, and this happens every week to me, which is kind of silly. But anyways, I just looked at my thought to myself, isn't that what life is all about? Watching, feeling, capturing the magic. And I just and I just want to say thank you because that to us is a gift. Amen. We do. We love it. Thank you so much, Wendy. Um, you guys are fantastic. Do you have any anything I shouldn't should have asked that I didn't that you want to tell us? Go outside and love nature. Remember, we only have one planet. Oh, true. What, what she said, plus that's my goal in painting and why I paint nature is I want other people to get out and, sh and experience what I'm experiencing and uh, and incorporate that into their own lives. Go to the national parks. Stay away from water buffalo. Yeah, just be careful out there. Don't touch Trevor's <laughs> Yeah, don't touch Trevor's brushes. And if you want to see a beautiful, how many of you love Columbine flowers? There's a beautiful painting over in, in Jan's studio. So just so you know where they are, Kathy Sheeter, if you go by the front desk here, take a left, she's straight ahead in that corner. And um, Trevor is down toward the, the curly metal stuff. yeah, by the curly metal stuff. Um, <laughs> to the east, which is the direction of the McDowell Mountains. And Jan Bouchard is just straight down this side. Um, you'll see her on the right-hand side and her husband Danny's work. Um, so thank you guys so much. Come up closer and look at the work here. Next week, um, we could have had you on next week, but this was way better. But next week, the topic is um, addition through subtraction. So it's about artists who take away to create works of art. So um, thank you all so much. And thanks for joining us. Thank you.